Chapter 18 of Ride Proud Rebel by Andre Norton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Texas Spurs. A soft wind curled languidly in through the open church window, stirring the curly lock, which Boyd now and then impatiently pushed away from his eyes, was a delicate fingertip touch on Drew's cheek. A subdued shuffle of feet could be heard as the congregation arose. It was Sunday in Gainesville, and a congregation such as could only have gathered there on this particular May 7, 1865. Rusty gray-brown, patched, and with ill-mended tears, which no amount of painstaking effort could ever convert again into more than dimly respectable uniforms, a sprinkling of civilian broadcloth and feminine bonnets, and across the church a smaller block of once hostile blue. As the recessional formed, prayer books were closed, to be slipped into pockets or reticules. The presiding celebrant moved down from the altar, his supplice tugged aside by the wandering breeze, revealing the worn cavalry boots of a captain. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Men's voices, hesitant and rusty at first, then rose confidently over the more decorous hum of the regular churchgoers, as old memories were renewed. Lord of them all, to these we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. The hymn swelled, a mighty powerful wave of sound. Drew's hard calloused hands closed on the back of the pew ahead. Hearing Boyd's voice break, Drew knew that within them both something had loosened. The apathy which had held them through these past days was going, and they were able to feel again. Drew, Boyd's voice quavered and then steadied. Let's go home. They had shared the talk at camp, the discussion about slipping away to join Kirby Smith in Texas, and some had even gone before the official surrender of Confederate forces east of the Mississippi three days earlier. But when General Forrest elected to accept Yankee terms, most of the men followed his example. Back at camp, they were making out the paroles on the blanks furnished by the Union command. But so far, no Yankee had appeared in person. The cavalry were to retain their horses and mules, and whole companies planned to ride home together to Tennessee and Kentucky. Drew and Boyd could join one of those. As they moved toward the church door now, three of the Union soldiers who had attended the service were directly ahead of them in the aisle. Boyd caught urgently at Drew's arm. Those spurs! Look at his spurs! He pointed to the heels of the middle Yankee. Sunlight made those ornate discs of silver very bright. Drew's breath caught, and he took a long stride forward, put his hand on the blue coat's shoulder. The man swung around, startled to face him. Sir, where did you get those spurs? Drew's tone carried the note of one who expected to be answered promptly, with the truth. The Yankee had straight black brows which drew together in a frown as he stared back at the Confederate. I don't see how that's any of your business, Reb. Drew's hand went to his belt before he remembered that there wasn't any weapon there, and no need for one now. He regained control. It's this much my business, sir. Those spurs are Mexican. They were taken from a Mexican officer at Chapultepec and the last time I saw them, they were worn by a very good friend of mine who's been missing since February. I'd like very much indeed to know just how and where you got them. Lifting one booted foot, the Yankee studied the spurs as if they had somehow changed their appearance. When his eyes came back to meet Drew's, his frown was gone. Reb, I bought these from a fellow in another outfit about two or three weeks ago. He was on sick leave and was going home. I gave him good hard cash for him. Did he say where he got them, pressed Drew? The other shook his head. He had a pile of stuff, mostly reb, buckles, spurs, and such. Sold it all around camp before he left. 
What outfit are you? Boyd asked. Trooper, any trouble here? A Yankee major bore down on them from one side, a Confederate captain from the other. No, sir, Drew replied quickly. I just recognized a pair of spurs this trooper's wearing. They belong to a friend of mine who's been missing for some time. I hoped maybe the trooper knew something about them. Well, do you? The major demanded of his own man. No, sir. Bought these in camp from a fellow going on furlough. I don't know where he got them. Satisfied, soldier? The officer asked Drew. Yes, sir. Before he could add another word, the major was shepherding his men away. I'm sorry. The Confederate captain shook his head. Pity he didn't have any more definite information for you. He glanced at Drew's set face. But, Sergeant, the news wasn't all bad. No, sir. Only Anse never would have parted with those while he was alive and could prevent it. Never in this world. Where was your friend when he was reported missing? We were on scout in Tennessee. Both of us were wounded. I was found by our men, but he wasn't. There was just a chance he might have been taken prisoner. Men will be coming back from their prisons now. What's his name and company, Sergeant? I'll ask around. Anson Kirby. He was with Gano's Texans under Morgan, and then he transferred with me into General Buford's scouts. He was about nineteen or twenty, had reddish hair and a scar here. With a forefinger, Drew traced a line from the left corner of his mouth to his left temple. He was shot in the left shoulder pretty bad when we were separated. The captain nodded. I'll keep a lookout. A lot of Texans pass through here on their way home. Thank you, sir. Should you have any news, I'd be obliged to hear it. My name's Drew Rennie, sir, and you can address me a message. Care of the Barretts, Oak Hill. That's in Fayette County, Kentucky. But the chance of ever receiving such news was, Drew thought, very improbable. That afternoon, when he tried to find Boyd, he, too, was missing, and none of the headquarters company knew where the boy had gone. Ain't pulled out, though, Webb assured. Said as how you two were planning to head north with the Kentuck boys, right after the old man says goodbye. Guess I'll trail along with you for a spell. You got across Tennessee to get to Kentuck. Going home, Will? Guess so. Heard tell as how they burned out an old man. Don't know. That there sure hard scrabble ground. We never did make us a good crop on it. Maybe so. We'll try somewhere else now. Sort of got me an itching foot. Maybe won't tie down anywhere for a spell. What about you, Injun? Drew turned to Croft. Going back to the nations. Guess they had it hard there, too. General Wait and the Union pins raiding back and forth. They'll need schools, though, and someone to teach them. You a teacher, Injun? Webb was plainly startled. Starting to be one before the band start playing Dixie so loud, Croft said, smiling. Maybe I've forgotten too much, though. I have to see if I can fit me in behind the desk again. Here's the kid. Drew looked up at Webb's hail. Boyd walked toward them, his saddlebag slung over one shoulder, under his arm the haversack for rations, which normally hung from any forager's saddle horn. He dropped them by the fire, and held two gleaming objects out to Drew. Anse's spurs. How'd you get them? Sold my horse to the sutler at the Yankee camp, then bought him. That trooper gave him to me for just what he paid. Five dollars hard money. Said as how he could understand why you wanted to have them. But your horse? Boyd grinned. Looky here, Drew. More than half this here Reb Army is footin' at home. I guess I can cross two little states without it finishing me off. Leastwise, I reckon anyone who has toughened it out with General Forrest can do that much. Drew turned the spurs around in his hands, which were a little shaky. We got Croker, and we'll take turns riding. No two states ain't too far for a couple of troopers, especially if they have them, a good stout mule into the bargain. A hot copper sun turned late Kentucky May into August weeks ahead of season. Thunder 
muttered sullenly beyond the horizon, and a breeze picked up road dust and grit, plastering it to Croker's sweating hide, their own unwashed skin. Better ride. Licking dust from his lips, Drew watched the weaving figure on the other side of the mule with dull concern. They were steadying themselves by a tight grip on the stirrups, and Croker was supporting and towing them rather than their steering him. Boyd's head lifted. Ride yourself. He got a ghost of his old defiance into that, though his voice was hardly more than a harsh croak of whisper. I ain't giving in now. He released his stirrup hold, staggering forward a step or two, and would have gone face down on the turnpike if Drew had not made a big effort to reach him. But the other's weight bore him along, and they both sprawled on the road. Croker came to a halt, his head hanging, until he could have nuzzled Drew's shoulder. They had made a brave start from Alabama, keeping up with the company they joined until they were close to the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Then a blistered heel had forced Drew into the rider's roll for two days, and they had fallen behind. The rations they had drawn had been stretched as far as they would go. Even though there were people along the way willing to feed a hungry soldier, there were too many hungry soldiers. The farther north they traveled, there was also a growing number of places where a blue coat might be welcome, but a gray one still signified enemy. Drew moved and raised Boyd's head and shoulder to his knee. If he could summon enough energy to reach the canteen hanging from Croker's saddle, somehow he did, recklessly spilling a cupful of its contents on Boyd's face and turning road dust into flecks of mud which freckled the gaunt cheeks. Ain't gonna ride. Boyd's eyes opened and he took up the argument again. Well, Drew lashed out, I can't carry you. Or do you expect to be dragged? Boyd's face crumbled, and he flung up his arms to hide his eyes. All right. With the aid of a sloping bank and an effort, which left them both weakly panting, Boyd was mounted, and they started their slow crawl once more. Drew! He raised his head. Boyd had straightened in the saddle and was pointing ahead, though his outstretched hand was shaking. We made it! There's home. Beyond was the green trees, a whole line of trees curving along a gravel carriage drive. But somehow Drew could not match Boyd's joy. He was tired, so tired, that he was aware of nothing really but the aching weariness of his body. They turned into the drive, the gravel crunching into his hold boots, while the tree shadows made a green twilight. Croker came to a stop, and Drew's eyes raised from the gravel to the line of one step, and then another. His gaze finally came to a broad veranda, to someone who had been sitting there and who was now on her feet, staring wide-eyed back at the three of them. Then the gravel came up in a wave, and he was swallowed up in it and darkness. The sun, warmed through the windows, awoke a glint of reflection from the top of the chest of drawers, where rested a round cord of bullion with two tassels and a pair of fancy spurs. The wink of light was reflected again from the mirror before which Drew stood. Jefferson's shirt has long enough sleeves, but all these billows. Cousin Mary's tongue clicked against her teeth in exasperation. Her hand was in the middle of Drew's back, gathering up a good pleating of linen. But he still had extra folds of cloth to spare over his ribs. Four days of rest and plenty of food was not sufficient to restore any padding to his frame. You certainly grew one way, but not the other. Boyd, established in the big chair by the window, laughed. I could take a few tucks, Drew offered. You could take a few tucks? Her astonished face showed in the glass above his shoulder. Oh, I'm not too bad with a needle. Did you note those neat patches on my breeches? I noted nothing about those breeches. They went straight into the fire. Such rags. Miss Mary, ma'am, small Hetty, showed an eager face around the corner of the door. Major Forbes and Mrs. Forbes, they're downstairs. 
Drew faced away from the mirror. Why, he demanded, with almost hostile emphasis. Meredith Barrett untied the strings of her sewing apron. Hetty, tell Mam Gusta to set out some of the English biscuits and make tea. Then she turned back to face Drew. Why, Drew? Rather, why not? They're your kin, and I think that Marianna feels it deeply that you came here and not to Red Springs, not to go home. Home? There was heat in that. You, if anyone, know that Red Springs was never really my home, and Forbes is an officer in the Union Army. This is no time for a Reb to camp out in his house. My grandfather wanted the place to be just Aunt Marianna's, didn't he? He paused by the chest of drawers, his hand going out to the spurs, the gold cord. Three years, in a way a small lifetime, all to be summed up now by a slightly tarnished cord from a general's hat, a pair of spurs a young Texan had jauntily worn. But it was a lifetime. He was not a boy any more. To have to endure his elders making decisions for him, his future was his own, and he had earned the right to that. Drew did not know that his face had hardened, that he suddenly looked a stranger to the woman who was watching him with concern. Please, Drew, you mustn't allow yourself to be so bitter. Bitter about Red Springs, you mean? Lord, I never wanted the place. I hate every brick of it. I think I always have. But I don't hate Forbes or Aunt Mariana, if that's what you're afraid of. It's just that I have no place there any more. Her mouth tightened. But you have. You owe it to Marianna to listen to her now. This is important, Drew, more important than you can guess. No, Boyd. Her gesture checked her son as he rose from the chair. This is none of your affair. Come with me, Drew. He picked up a borrowed coat, also much too wide for him, pulled it on over the bunchiness of his shirt, and followed her, swallowing what he knew to be a useless protest. The parlor was bright with sun, as the upper room had been. As Drew entered a pace or two behind Cousin Mary, the officer in blue strode away from the hearth to meet them. But Aunt Mariana forestalled her husband's greeting, rising suddenly from a chair, her crinoline rustling across the carpet. She held out her hands, and then hesitated, studying Drew's face. Looking a little daunted, as if she had expected something she did not find. The assurance she had displayed at their last meeting on the Lexington Road was missing. Drew? He bowed, conscious that he must present an odd figure in the ill-fitting clothing of Meredith Baxter's long-dead husband. Major Forbes held out his hand. Welcome home, my boy. My boy, conscious or unconsciously, the Major's tone strove to thrust Drew into the past, or so he believed. The Major might also be considering Drew an unruly schoolboy now safely out of some scrape. Welcome indeed, if he would settle down quietly into the conventional mold of Oak Hill or Red Springs. But he was no schoolboy, and at that moment the parlor of Oak Hill, for all its luxury and warmth, was a box, sealing him in stifling confinement which he could no longer endure. Drew held tight control over that resurgence of his old impatience, knowing that his first instinct had been right. The old life fitted him now no better than his coat, but he answered civilly, Thank you, sir. His proper courtesy apparently reassured his aunt. She came to him, her hands on his shoulders, as she stood on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. Drew, come home with us, dear, please. He shook his head. I don't belong at Red Springs, ma'am. I never did. Nonsense. Major Forbes put the force of a field officer's authority into that denial. I do not, and never did agree, with many of Alexander Maddock's decisions. I do so even less when they pertain to your situation, my boy. You have every right to consider Red Springs your home. You must come to us. Resume your interrupted education. Take your proper place in the family and the community. Drew shook his head again. The Major paused. He had been studying Drew, 
and now there was a faint shadow of uneasiness in his own expression. He might be slowly realizing that he was not fronting a repentant schoolboy rescued from a piece of regrettable, youthful folly. A veteran was being forced against his will to recognize the stamp of his own experience on another, if much younger, man. "'What are your plans?' he asked, in another tone of voice entirely. Drew, Major Forbes waved aside the tentative interruption from Cousin Mary. "'I don't know, but I can't stay here.' That was much he was sure of. Oak Hill, Red Springs, all of this was no longer necessary to him any more than the outgrown toys of childhood could hold the interest of a man. Once, hurt and seeking for freedom, he had thought of the army as home. Now he knew he had yet to find what he wanted or needed, but there was no reason why he could not go looking, even if he could not give a name to the object of such a search. I might go west. It's all new out there. A good place to start on my own. There was a catch of breath from Aunt Mariana. The look she gave Cousin Mary held something of accusation. You told him? Told me what, ma'am? That your father's alive. She saw his surprise. Is that true, sir? Drew appealed to the Major. Forbes scowled, tugging at the belt supporting his saber. Yes, we found some letters among your grandfather's papers after his death. Your father wasn't killed. He was in a Mexican prison during the war. When he escaped and returned to Texas, your grandfather had already been there and taken your mother away. Hunt Rennie was too ill to follow immediately. Before he had recovered enough to travel, he was informed his wife was dead, and he was allowed to believe that you died with her at birth. But why? Alexander Maddock had disliked, even hated, his grandson. So why should he have lied to keep Drew with him at Red Springs? Because of Murray, Cousin Mary said slowly, sadly. It was a cruel thing to do, so cruel. Alexander Maddock was a hard man. He couldn't bear opposition. It made him go close to the edge of sanity. I truly believe. I know we're not supposed to speak ill of the dead, but I can't forgive him for what he did to those two. Melanie and Hunt were so young, young and in love, and your Uncle Murray deliberately pushed that quarrel on Hunt. Jefferson was there. He tried to stop it. The duel was not Hunt's fault. Uncle Murray and my father fought a duel, Drew demanded. Yes, Murray was badly wounded, and for a time his life was despaired of. Your grandfather swore out a warrant against Hunt for attempted murder. So he and Melanie ran away. They were so pitifully young. Melanie was just sixteen, and Hunt two years older, though he seemed a man, having lived such a hard life on the frontier. They went back to Texas, and she was very happy there. I had some letters from her. Yes, she was happy, until the war with Mexico began. Then Hunt was reported killed, his father too and she was left all alone with distant kin of theirs. So your grandfather went down to fetch her home. I always believed he really wanted to punish her for going against his will. She died. Her voice broke. She died because she had no will to live. And then he was sorry. But just a little. Not enough to blame himself any. Oh, no. It was still all Hunt's wickedness, he said. Every bit of it. He was a hard man. Cousin Mary faced Aunt Mariana with her chin up as if daring the other to object what she had just said. Drew returned to the news he still found difficult to believe. So my father's alive, Major? Well, that gives me some place to go, Texas. Hunt Rennie's not in Texas. Cousin Mary spoke with such certainty that all three of them gave her their full attention. I married Jefferson Barrett six months after Melanie eloped. We went to Europe then for almost two years of traveling. Part of our mail must have been lost. Hunt surely wrote to me. He liked Jefferson in spite of the differences in their ages. If I had only had a chance to tell him the truth about you, Drew, but I never knew he was alive either. 
You remember Granger Wood, Justin? Major Forbes nodded. He went out to California in 50. Yes, and when the war broke out, he rode back across the Arizona and New Mexico territories with General Johnston to enlist in the Confederate forces. A month ago he came back here, and he called to tell me he saw Hunt in Arizona in 61. He had a horse and cattle ranch there, also some mining holdings. Drew, Aunt Mariana caught his arm. You won't be so foolish as to go out into that horrible wilderness hunting a man who doesn't even know you're alive, who's a perfect stranger to you. You must be sensible. We know that Father's will was very unjust, and we are not going to abide by its terms. Half of Red Springs will be yours. Drew gently released himself from her hold. Maybe Hunt Rennie doesn't know I exist. Maybe we won't even like each other, if and when we do meet. I don't know. But Red Springs ain't my kind of world any more, and I won't take anything my grandfather grudged giving me. I may be young, only in another way I'm old, too. Too old to come under a school and rain again. He glanced across her shoulder, noticing that his speech had registered with the Major. You're not going to start out this very afternoon, are you? Forbes asked. Drew relaxed and laughed a little self-consciously, knowing that his uncle had ceded him the victory in this first skirmish. No, sir. You know, I bought two things home from the army, and one of them was a pair of Texas spurs. A mighty good man wore those. You'd have to ride proud and tall in the saddle to match him. I told him once I was going to see Texas, and he said there was nothing to make a man stay on the range where he had been born. Since I've always wanted to know what kind of man Hunt Rennie was, is, now maybe, I'm going to do just that. End of Chapter 18 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Real Medina, Texas End of Ride Proud Rebel by Andre Norton